Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here today, especially as I haven't seen the two of you together since my uh, confirmation hearings some time ago with the National Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. Um, my background is in the record, um, and my statement is as well. I'm going to speak to you today as a scientist, as a citizen, and as a grandmother. I am deeply concerned about the violation of a basic human right when it comes to where we are in cell phone research today. Democracy, as you know very well, rests on the right to know, on the freely given consent of the governed to be governed. I would submit that where we lack information about the potential hazards of a widespread technology, our basic right to know is being violated. We have to ask, why are other governments issuing the warnings? Why are the governments of Finland and Israel, which are no strangers to radar or electromagnetic technologies, why are they issuing concerns about this particular issue? I think, as you began your remarks, Senator Harkin, about tobacco, it's important for us to recognize that there's no one in this room today who doubts that we should have acted sooner about tobacco. Now, when we should have acted, one can debate. But as I say in my book, we certainly could have acted in the 1950s. And when President Nixon started the war on cancer in 1971, an admirable act, he ignored tobacco although the Surgeon General had warned about its dangers in 1964. I think it's fair to say we don't have a level playing field in this issue. And the absence of definitive epidemiologic evidence is not proof that there's not a problem. Rather, it's a reflection of the fact that we do not have a level playing field. That the United States today has not published a new epidemiologic study on brain cancer and cell phones since 2002. Now, although the NIH budget doubled under Senator Specter's leadership in five years, the budget for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences has only recently doubled. It took 11 years, sir, to get there. And that is the institute that is charged with doing the study. I would point out the study we heard about from Dr. Booker was originally proposed in 2002, and now we hear that because of delays, which I think I need not tell you why they occurred, because of those delays, the study results will not be available to 2014. And we are talking about a technology that affects every single one of us, whether we're users or inadvertently exposed. Now, Dr. Sudetsky has told you, I think, in considerable detail why epidemiology is difficult. I want to add that the Hiroshima data involved a single exposure to an atom bomb that took 40 years before you could find an effect. We're talking about cell phones that many of us are using all the time. And children are using at unprecedented levels. And we have never been exposed to this level in, in our lives. I want to also tell you, unfortunately, that there has been a history here that I think we need to recognize. When Professor Henry Lai and Singh developed the pioneering new technique for measuring DNA damage called the comet assay that shows you a tail of DNA when it's damaged. They developed that in 1994. If they'd been more modest, it would have been called the Lie and Sing assay, but it's called the comet assay. Professor Lai is with us here today. When they developed that assay in 1994, they showed that radio frequency exposure to brain cells of the rat could be damaging in terms of the comet assay. The industry response, which has been documented and is in my book as well as other places, was this. First, they went to NIH and tried to get their funding revoked. Then, they went to the journal that had accepted the article for publication who, and tried... Who is they? The industry working against seeing this work published, okay? And I have the details and the names of the PR firms, the individuals who wrote the memos in my book, which I'll be happy to attach for the record. Then the same lobbyists tried to get the article unaccepted in a journal where it had been accepted. And finally, they hired other scientists to do advocacy research to try to invalidate the science. And when those scientists actually confirmed the work, it was never published. A similar story can be told today in Europe about a major multi-million dollar EU-supported study called the Reflex Program that was a multi-laboratory study in many countries that also showed evidence that radio frequency signal at precisely the level of today's phones could damage DNA, contrary to the assertion that only ionizing radiation can damage DNA. And those researchers were also subject to the same kinds of attack and have recently been exonerated by an independent review by the Medical University of Vienna. 
So I think it's clear the United States needs to catch up. We need to catch up with our European allies and see that we issue warnings for our children as well. And I have a very simple proposal. We definitely need major research on this issue. Unlike tobacco, almost everybody in the world is using a cell phone today. We need research desperately, but what, how are we going to fund that in this difficult time? I have a simple proposal. We can place a $1 user fee on a cell phone every year for three years. There's not one parent in this room that wouldn't like to know what a cell phone will mean for their child's brain in the future. And that $1 fee should, should support international and independent research because unfortunately we have not had independent research in this area. And finally, I believe it's appropriate at this time to ask the FDA and the FCC to review existing standards. Existing standards for cell phones are based on causing heat avoiding the acute injury of a thermal effect. And the way phones are used today for periods, unfortunately, in some cases of hours, it's time for us to move beyond that to a new approach. I thank you both very, very much for your interest in this. I think you've done the world a great service by bringing us together. And I want to say I am not alarmed. I am concerned because the th world has changed very rapidly and we have a right to know what that change may mean for our health and that of our grandchildren. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Davis.